Tonight's top European Union stories from the Unit UK include UK to review accounting changes after EU deal European Union referendum bill branded dead parrot after House of Lords vote EU membership for Scotland by 2016 is implausible, writes Liddington. And European Union advice sought on Kit Kat ruling. Plus, the EU's first Sentinel satellite to launch in April. It's Tuesday, 28th of January. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit UK Nightly News. First up, the hot story from our website, theunituk.com. Britain's competition watchdog will review changes it has ordered to prize open an accounting sector dominated by four big players after the European Union agreed a tougher set of reforms. Britain's Competition Commission decided in October the country's top 350 companies must put their bookkeeping out to tender at least once a decade to shake up a market dominated by KPMG, PwC, EY and Deloitte. Since then, the EU agreed in December to go a step further and force listed companies across the 28-country block from 2016 to actually change their accountant every 10 years. Britain's Competition Commission said, We are keen to follow the principles of better regulation, including by ensuring that our orders do not contradict or duplicate EU regulation. David Barnes, head of policy at Deloitte, said the audit market faced a potential quantum of changes and welcomed efforts to align their introduction. Now, there are two points to highlight in this story. Firstly, this highlights the top-down legislative cascade. The European Union calls this direct effect, but the result is the same as this story demonstrates. The legislation is drawn up and prepared by the EU Commission. And remember, that is the 28-member body that is neither elected by you or accountable to you. From there, this traverses the EU Parliament, and I use the word traverse deliberately, finally being handed down to member states for implementation. Now, because of the nature of the EU treaties, these directives cannot be ignored without a direct veto already being in place. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the European Union's direct effect mechanism at work. Now, the second is a pattern of financial regulation appearing on the radar here at the unit. Let's take a quick recap. We have the Limited Liability ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, essentially a ring-fenced corporation with limited liability and diplomatic immunity, granted supreme authority to call in funds from shareholders i.e. the member states, with those shareholders being compelled to pay up within seven days without any recourse. The FITT, or Financial Transaction Tax, which provides audit and centralised traceability across all European equity and commodity markets. The European Central Bank, essentially providing a lender of last resort for the intended supernation state of the European Union. Now, yesterday I covered the new regulations being imposed upon the commodities markets. In our story, EU curb on food speculation gets qualified welcome from activists. And who can forget the changes in financial policies that enable bank bail-ins across all member states, giving European banks the power to extract funds from depositors' accounts by reclassifying their deposit customers as creditors. Once you start to join the dots, you quickly realise that the power grab by the EU for financial control is significant and almost complete. Well, well, I just love it when a prediction comes together. Last year, we predicted that the proposed EU referendum was a charade, a coalition mirage, It was King David's take on the Emperor's new clothes, a fictional notion created by Cabbage Patch Cameron for the purpose of political pop puree. The Prime Minister's attempt to give the British people a vote on membership of the European Union is a dead parrot, 
senior Conservatives have conceded. David Cameron's plan to enshrine in law an in-out vote came under sustained attack from Labour and Liberal Democrat peers in the House of Lords in what Conservatives claimed was a coordinated effort to kill off the bill. Peers voted on Friday to send back the bill with amendments to the Commons for further debate. Now that means it is unlikely to meet its deadline of clearing both Houses of Parliament by February 28th, its supporters conceded. It's a dead parrot, said Bill Cash, the chairman of the European Scrutiny Select Committee. He continued by saying, Passing the amendments means it can't make the timetable. For practical purposes, this bill is dead. There's no chance it can pass. So, my friends, as you can see, and as we correctly pointed out, they, that is the kleptocratic corporate puppets that have usurped our government and sold Britain out from under the feet of the people, have absolutely no intention of giving you a democratic voice on whether you wish to continue the assimilation into a federal European superstate. Now, whenever you're ready to put down your cup of tea, put on your dancing shoes and join the action, drop us an email and we'll point you in the right direction to get started. Britain's Minister for Europe poured cold water on the prospect of Scotland enjoying a swift, smooth accession to the European Union if Scottish nationalists win an independence referendum this year. The warning, coming 244 days before Scots go to the polls to decide whether they want to remain part of Britain, marked the last instalment of a campaign by the British government in London to keep a 307-year-old union with Scotland intact. Minister for Europe David Liddington said Scotland would need to have unanimous approval from the EU's 28 members on every detail of its accession if it was to gain membership by March 24, 2016, the independence date pencilled in by Scotland's nationalist First Minister Alex Salmond. Now remember people, united we stand and divided we fall. Make no joke of it, this theatre being played out by the SNP is but a single act from a larger overshadowing play. It has no foundation in creating a true independence for Scotland, because, in fact, it is worse than a simple change of master. In this guise, the situation is worsened further because Alex Salmond, who has now weakened his negotiating position by announcing a fixed timetable for accession to the European Union. Indeed, it would require unanimous approval from the other 28 member states, and that will come, as it did with Britain, with a list of economic and resource-grabbing conditions that will ensure that the Scottish people become economically and politically impotent. When the Romans attempted to control Scotland and subvert its independence from the Caledonians, there was at least an honesty in their empirical intentions. What we see today is clandestine, nefarious and corrupt. But make no mistake, here at the unit we are watching, we are researching. We see your deception and we seek to root you out. A judge deliberating on a legal dispute relating to the shape of a Kit Kat has decided to have a break and wait for a decision from a European court. Mr Justice Arnold is analysing a high court argument between confectionery giants Nestle, which sells Kit Kat bars, and Cadbury. Nestle wants to register the three-dimensional shape of a Kit Kat as a trademark. Cadbury has objected. The judge heard legal argument from both sides at a hearing in London in December. Certain aspects of the relevant law remain unclear, said Mr Justice Arnold and I have decided it is necessary to seek clarification of the law from the Court of Justice of the European Union in order to determine a decision on this dispute. And now for a little contest in consumer brand awareness. We're going to be sending Kit Kats to the first five people that email into us correctly identifying the product to which this slogan belongs. What's got a hazelnut in every bite? The date has been set for the rollout of the European Union's multi-billion Euro-Earth observation project. 
Copernicus will fly a constellation of satellites known as the Sentinels to take a continuous health check on the planet and to acquire data that can help inform and enforce EU policies. It has been announced that the first spacecraft in the ser series will go into orbit most likely in early April. Sentinel-1A will use radar to map the surface of the Earth. Its information will find myriad uses, from monitoring European central coastal waters for oil spills to investigating subsidence in cities. Typically in Europe, we're always looking across the Atlantic, and if we see something we like, we build a smaller version of it here. But something like Copernicus doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, and that's why our American and other international partners are extremely interested in collaborating. Satellites are at their most powerful when their data is continuous and unbroken in time. To that end, the vision of Copernicus is that it becomes an open-ended mission of overlapping satellites. Sentinel-1B is already in production, with early discussions already taking place on the procurement of the 1C and 1D models. And likewise, the first satellites in Sentinel-2 and 3 series are well advanced, and these will carry instruments focused on changes that occur over time in land cover and ocean behaviour, and will launch next year. Atmospheric sensors, known as Sentinel-4 and 5, will go up later this decade, and Sentinel-6 will continue the work of a current satellite that measures the height and shape of ocean surfaces. This is a great opportunity to talk about how we in Britain are missing a tremendous opportunity to revitalise the UK Space Agency, and rekindle another industry that Great Britain was once a leader in. However, we have no time to cover that today as more pressing matters overtake us. Well, let's consider what this article is not saying. It is not saying that the European Union is planning to own and operate spy drones, surveillance satellites and aircraft as part of a new intelligence and security agency under the control of Baroness Ashton. The controversial proposals are a major move towards creating an independent EU military body with its own equipment and operational range of Sentinel satellites. The spy drones and secure command systems will be linked to a £3.5 billion spy satellite project known as Copernicus, which is to be used to provide imaging capabilities to support common security and defence policy missions and operations, as revealed in our legislation section earlier this month. Copernicus is part of the Sentinel system of satellites, which is costing British taxpayers £434 million. Previously, it was known as the Global Monitoring for Environment and Security Project. Think the unelected orcs in the Bruswellian Towers do not have an all-seeing eye? Think again, my friends. Today, in our video library, there is a rapidly developing team of external researchers that has started pointing us to ever more detail of the nefarious shenanigans of our political masterclass. There is a quickening taking place amongst many of the people in the UK, and you might be shocked to hear that the feelings of this group is that alarming numbers of our political masterclass are complicit in acts of treason. I have put a series of four video interviews between Brian Gerrish and Paul Joseph Watson at Prison Planet TV in our video library. And of course, if you haven't watched our documentary Betrayed already, then I put links to it below. Now, via the unit community on Google+, Vedic Pagan one posted this comment, but it piqued my interest. In support of his comments, he provided this opening trail of evidence. And here's the detail from the post. Hi, Rick found some info on the treason thing, and I think this is part of it, but I'm sure there's more. The abolition of Britain is illegal and treason under the British Constitution, and the criminal acts of the Queen and her ministers have included the worst acts of treason in history. They secretly repealed the full power of the treason laws in 1998, hidden in section 36.3 of the Crime and Disorder Act, to save their own necks. See also section 12 at the bottom. The Crime and Disorder Act Amendment 1998, section 1 of the M1 Treason Act of 1537, for these words. Have and suffer such pains of death, and there shall be substituted the words, be liable to imprisonment for life and to such. Now in the following enactments, namely 
Section 2 of the M2 Crown of Ireland Act 1542, occasioning disturbance, etc., to the Crown of Ireland punishable as high treason. And Section 12 of the M3 Act of Supremacy in Ireland 1560, penalties for maintaining or defending foreign authority. The above information comes from the legislation.gov.uk website, and I've included a link to that below. Vedic Pagan 01 goes on to say, I'll keep digging, I'm positive there's more, just a bit rusty, but I'll get the rest. Now, do you know about these ideas? Can you furnish us with more links and information? Perhaps you can help us to build a case. We understand that already complaints have been submitted to the constabularies in the UK. Perhaps you have access to or a copy of those dossiers. If you do, then let us have them. If we can get enough detail together, we're looking to record a special show to put the facts and evidence out there before the public. Now, remember to visit our website, theunituk.com, for all the very latest news. You can find our page on Facebook by searching for The Unit UK, which is all one word. Join our community on Google+, Plus, where you can interact with us, voice your opinions and post comments about our stories and even get involved in the shows. And for all the latest tweets as they happen, then follow us on Twitter, The E Unit. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for The Unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon.